Oh my god, you guys. You guys. You guys. I had to run to the store to get a new SIM card. I got like three because for some reason this one which is 128 gigabytes is perfectly fine decided to stop working um let me just uh. Uh. let's start over okay i already have my base done i have to touch it up because i wore a mask so it's obviously all smudged and damn, because I didn't bake, I didn't set it before. So, while I touch this up, let's start over. Also, I figured out what Swedish candy this smells like. Billar. Not Gillar, Galar, whatever the hell I was saying in the last episode. Billar. My father is looking down on me and he's like, girl you're something else and you know what i respect that i feel like i want to talk about stuff that like i'm learning and that i feel like could actually be educational for people um and my friend was like well why don't you just combine both things why don't you do makeup looks and talk about like instead of just sitting there and not talking why don't you talk about things that you're learning, things that people could actually learn from and have more of like a casual conversation about it. Obviously, this isn't a conversation because it's one person talking, more like a monologue, but I thought that was a really good idea. It's also good for me because it helps me retain the information that I'm learning because doing this and having the casual, letting myself casually talk about the things I'm learning and maybe someone can benefit from this might be the way to go so we're gonna start over i'm gonna reset my concealer and we're gonna talk about social reproduction theory now in my last video that didn't save i went on a whole history of karl marx because basically karl marx came up with also this is from my memory of sociology when i was a sociology major before I transferred to psychology. So this is like spark notes edition, okay? Okay, so Karl Marx basically came up with this theory of economic reproduction that the little guys at the base of the level who actually do the hard work are not receiving any of the rewards. They don't have any reinforcements. Um, and that the higher ups who aren't doing as much heavy work, heavy labor, are receiving all the profits and that this structure in society is going to be the downfall okay um he's basically like it's not fair that these monsters he calls them monsters which <laughs> um <laughs> get all of the profit they get to become billionaires whatever and then you got the little guys who are dying from covid and they aren't seeing any benefits Okay, so that's my little Karl Marx, daddy, godfather, you know, little snippet. So, Pierre Bardot, sugar daddy of all sugar daddies, the sugar daddy of sociology, the sex god, the French lover. <laughs> I'll put a photo of him here. Sugar Daddy right there. Um, he basically took this idea of economic reproduction and applied it to a educational setting and other institutions, um, the work field, and mostly education. And he came up with the idea of social and cultural reproduction. Um, he did this in the 1970s. So I guess that's why people are saying it's outdated. Like we've changed. Have we? No. Um, are we trying to? Maybe. And basically he, he said that he was observing 
He was observing French classrooms and he noticed that the curriculum and the environment was designed to support the dominant class. So you may ask, what's the dominant class, Erica? The dominant class are predominantly white backgrounds, but they are the upper and middle class societies. So how is the curriculum supporting this? How are they supporting these ideals? You know, like, give me an example. Um, well, if you think about the hidden curriculum, ask yourself, what books did you read in high school and middle school? Um, to me, for me, I read Catcher in the Rye, which I did not like. Um, Jane Eyre, which I did not like. Uh, 1984, which I don't remember. Um, Catch 22, Slaughterhouse 5, uh, Lord of the Flies, which I did like because it's, you know, talking about how society is. Um, I can't even, like, I can't think of anything else right now, but all of those novels, most of them, maybe I just, honestly, I didn't look up everything, but most of the curriculum is from a white perspective. That's an example, a very simple example of how classrooms reinforce these beliefs and these values that kind of give students from these backgrounds an advantage because they can relate to it more. Um, just to backtrack, the actual definition, I have it here for social reproduction is that society reinforces and enables roles that they expect every individual to fall into based on their race, their gender, their class status, and characteristics obtained by their upbringing. So like their cultural backgrounds. The fact that this cultural capital in classrooms is supporting and encouraging this dominant class to basically perform better than these other students is really problematic. And actually, I had to read a paper on the Affirmative Action in Brazil and a comment that the researcher made, her name is, um, I forgot the first name, but her last name is Diaz Lopez. Um, I'll put, if I can, the study that I read and you can read it. Um, but she basically did a lot of research and she found that the students' SES, which is their socioeconomic status, um, Characteristics such as school trajectory, parental education, and family income are associated with success in prestigious university admission exams. So those are correlated with how you perform on these admission exams. Uh, for instance, we can talk about the SATs. And I actually found an example online of a question from the SATs that... Um, shows racial bias in that those who could answer it more like correctly are from predominantly white upper class backgrounds. Also, my understanding is that school admissions are now not requiring SATs and ACTs and I know a lot of people are like, ah, I had to do that. So an example of a question from the SAT and I'm gonna give you like three seconds to try to figure this out is this they always had those questions where it was like blank is to blank as blank is to blank so just yeah so this question and i didn't know it was runner is to marathon as regatta is to dot 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 regatta regatta regetta i don't what is that what is that do you know take a moment Regatta is to rowing. And rowing, I looked it up just to double check everything, is statistically a predominantly upper and middle class white sport. No one talks about rowing. No, the only time the world focused on rowing was the Lori Laughlin USC scandal. 
No one else talked about rowing. I tried to do rowing at one point and I said, what the hell is this for? I don't wanna do rowing. Also, social network, rowing, Harvard, wow, okay. So, that's an example of how these admission exams are racially biased. And a lot of people don't think about that. I didn't think about that um, until I started having conversations about, you know, equal opportunities, equal outcomes, which can be a whole other video with me doing some crazy look, because that's gonna be a long conversation. Um, but basically, going back to researchers saying that this theory is outdated, it's not, pra like, it's not applied to modern society, um, could be argued because affirmative action is actually a example of social reproduction theory but basically also i have my computer here with some notes because if i don't have notes y'all this gonna be a three hour video and y'all gonna fall asleep and y'all gonna be like erica sh hurry up so i'm gonna get to the point also i need to do my makeup um basically affirmative action is a good thing um i know when i was in high school you know one of my teachers had asked us, we had talked so casually about affirmative action that like, I think it wasn't even really like explained properly. And basically what it is, is it's used to alleviate inequalities that are caused by social, economic, and racial backgrounds. So basically there's two forms of affirmative action there's well two ways that it's applied there's the quota system and there's the bonus system the quota system i think is a bit more reliable um a bit more useful but basically the quota system says that a certain percentage of students from a specific racial or SES background need to be admitted into the university. This is to help with the diversity, like percentages, allowing more equal opportunities, so on. The bonus system says that students from these specific backgrounds are allotted a certain amount of extra points to kind of like let's say it's like this, right? You have a white student from an upper class, a minority student with low SES. So when they're in the admissions process, we'll give them a few extra points so that they can kind of equal out. There are certain states in the US that banned affirmative action. Um, I mean, listen, you got Texas, you got Florida on the list. not really surprised but the one place I was surprised by was California California banned affirmative action in all like UC schools like California universities yeah in this study that I was reading about they found that since the banning of affirmative action the enrollment rates of minority students dropped significantly especially in stem majors which is you know like engineering so that's kind of sad don't you think but the other thing that's really interesting is that even with affirmative action and this is the thing that was that really stood out to me was that Regardless of having affirmative action, students who were admitted that came from minority backgrounds, lower SES um, communities, chose majors that were less successful in the job, you know, job force and had lower salaries. And that's where it gets interesting. A lot of, I feel like a lot of people would argue like, well, we let you in, it's now your decision to do what you want. But 
from my understanding at my university a lot of those intense programs you had to apply to get into them even once you were in school um, I know like the music program, the film school, the business school, I mean the medical programs. I know those you have to like specifically apply for those once you're in the school. So you can be in the general university but not within a specific school. Are those admissions processes being representative? Are they being fair and just in their selection process? I mean, I read other articles that had, um, excuse me, students interviewed and asked why, why did you choose this program? Like, why did you choose sociology? Like, they didn't choose business. Um, the article talked about medical school, business, engineering, mathematics, and so on. And. Uh, a lot of the students felt that even within those programs, they wouldn't be successful because those programs also continue to have hidden curriculums that support this cultural capital of the dominant class. Yes, the admission process to get into the university might be addressed in some places. Once you're in, it's there's a whole other obstacle. There's so many things you have to overcome within that like for instance i'm i'm in the education program psych and i'm also doing psychology classes um in my undergrad a lot of the articles i would read would be written by white scientists white psychologists like a lot of things are based on western cultures western ideologies and so on and I didn't really learn a lot about Eastern culture perspectives or minority studies until grad school. Now they're using articles and studies that are more representative of these cultures. The argument a lot of researchers have besides saying it's outdated is that his Bordeaux theory doesn't take into account rational choice, which came after. People, yes, they're aware of what's happening in society, but they don't let that limit their opportunities. They say, no, I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna get to that prestigious school. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do what I can to afford resources. So students who, like let's say are in high school and they can't afford to have um, tutoring lessons for the entrance exam for college, they will work part-time at a pharmacy, they'll work part-time at you know a convenience store or anywhere um, so that they can pay to have tutoring lessons or pay for any sort of teaching, tutoring resources. And that that kind of bumps them up to be able to do well on the exam, which is true. That's true. Like that, that could be true for some students. But I also wonder um, if that is still causing more stress because now you're taking on a part time job which comes with so many things. You have to deal with angry customers. You have to, maybe your shift is the night shift. And so if you have a class test the next day and you're at work trying to study, you're not in an environment that is the best fit to really retain what you're learning and be able to perform well on the test. And so some could argue that that's causing just another stressor, another barrier to do well in an academic setting um so it's still a hardship a disadvantage for students there's a lot to it there's a lot to it that people just don't talk about people just don't people just don't care so oh that brow looks good oh And 
I feel like in regards to the rational choice theory, um, yeah, there's, I mean, I have friends who had that situation where they were like, I don't have the resources, I don't have the income, my family can't afford to pay for a tuition for this school, whatever, like that I got into. Um, and they worked their asses off to get to that like level of education. They worked their butts off to get that job that pays well so that they can pay off their loans that they had to take out for school. That's just not the case for everyone. And so I think that regardless of being able to do that, having that, you know, advantage, I think social reproduction theory is still very much so in education at the core level. Mostly the curriculum I think is ableist. I think it is racist. And I think it is elitist. Sorry, I can't relate to Jane Eyre or Pride and Prejudice where these rich lords and dukes are whining about wives up in the attic. I don't can't relate to that. Nobody can relate to that. If you can relate to that, you need to see a therapist. If you have your wife locked up in the attic, you need to go to prison. Y'all, I can sit here and talk about this forever. Dude, I was watching this Korean drama Penthouse and I talked about it in my last video. And that is the perfect freaking example of these upper class students and families just always winning, always having the system choose them regardless of the work that the lower classes put in. And there's a part where one of the girls is an amazing singer. She's an amazing singer. And all of these kids are trying to get into this classical school, this classical like music school. And her mom's like a working mom. She's a single mother. And she's like, like, we can't afford it. We can't, like, I can't afford to get you lessons, you know. And so her daughter gets a job at, like, a part-time job. And her mom continues to work and work and ends up getting involved with, like, you know, um, loan sharks. She, like, takes out loans to pay for lessons and stuff. And her daughter ends up performing at the audition, does really well. But of course, she gets on the wait list instead of getting into the school because they let in all of these legacies, all of these kids who had parents who paid donations. Um, this is all sounding really familiar to me. If you went to the same university I did for undergrad, that's how it is for a lot of US schools or a lot of elite schools in general, especially private schools. There were so many kids who got into my undergrad solely because their parents donated thousands of dollars to build some little pointy things. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna explain it any further. I mean, I, full disclosure, I 1000% believe that I got into my university because of legacy. And that's something that I am self-aware of, I acknowledge. Um, I don't think I got in because of my abilities, because my abilities were neglected. And that's a whole other video about freaking intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities so we'll do that in another video but doing a very subtle look i'm going out at midnight with my friend and we're gonna go do a night photo shoot at the castle two little peasants going up to the castle acting like we rule the world when in reality as soon as i finish this program i'm probably gonna be in Loads of debt, no job, living at home, scratching my butt. It is what it is, ain't it? Shit, guys, I feel like I went through that so quickly. Talking about Bordeaux, I like got nothing else to say. 
Um, another study I read in a different class um, talked about Sweden, which everyone knows I hold close and dear to my heart as I was born there and I'm Swedish American. Sweden has a lot of issues, as do most nations. I read a study that um, looked at two universities, I believe one was Malmö, 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 the other one was Lund, maybe not Lund, but they were in the south of Sweden. And they interviewed, well, the issue with this study, a limitation, is that they only interviewed eight students. Eight students! Maybe at the time they did this research, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of diversity in Sweden, but they only interviewed eight freaking students. Um, they interviewed these students, and this was in the context of um, physical education programs. So these students chose to go into masters that um, trained them to become physical ed teachers, so PE teachers. The researchers did some, you know, background checks, and they found that in Sweden, uh, PE teachers are predominantly white. I mean, Sweden's predominantly white. And there was like a lack of representation. Another thing I learned was that students who are minorities and they're in a classroom and they're just surrounded by people who don't look like them and they're teachers that don't look like them, they tend to feel neglected and they also feel like, what's the point? What's the point in me learning when I like already feel like other and like excluded? Um, and so the researchers on this study wanted to see if these students chose to follow through with this program of physical education so that they could lead this like cause to have more representation in um, physical education careers. And they also used Bordeaux's re social reproduction theory to kind of set up their framework for their study. And they found that the students they interviewed did not feel like they were racially discriminated against. They felt like they didn't really face any prejudice um, in Sweden. And they, uh, just were like, yeah, no, I'm just doing it because I like, I like being physical, like I like being fit. Um, but what was interesting was that the students they interviewed were students who grew up in Sweden. They were either born in Sweden to minority parents and spoke fluently Swedish, had kind of already like assimilated to the culture. They were basically, they identified as like Swedish and their other culture. Or they had students who moved to Sweden when they were four or five and spoke fluent Swedish. How I felt was like these students are basically already assimilated into the culture, like a, like like embrace their culture. I mean, that's I feel like that's how anyone feels. Like if you're willing to embrace my culture and like become one of us, then like, yeah, I'll be nice to you, like it. Eh. And so I thought it'd be interesting if they redid that study with a bigger sample size with students who didn't grow up in Sweden, who maybe moved to Sweden or studying there as international students. That's where it'll get interesting, what it? I mean, you could say the same thing about the US, doing a, a study on international students versus students who moved here when they were babies. Like what? This stuff is just so mind boggling to me. But this even needs to be a conversation, like, I don't know, I mean, it's easier said than done, but, like, does it really have to be that hard? I don't know. I feel like so many people are going to say I'm a communist in this. I'm a socialist, so let's just say that right now. Um, I don't like, you know, I'm not like a socialist, socialist, but like, Bernie's sexy to me. I'm just going to say that. I did a very simple look today because I'm going to do like a dark red lip. Try to decide if I want to do brown or red. Maybe I'll do brown. I'm going to finish my face off camera. And then I'm going to come back with some finishing remarks.
That's all. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this TED talk on social reproduction theory. I'll see you next time.